The first of our two readings is from 1 John 4, verses 19 to 21. We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister, whom they have seen, cannot love God, whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. Our second reading is from Romans 5, verses 6 to 8. You see, at just the right time, when we are still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person. The fruit for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This is the word of the Lord. And I think we've got our final Bible reading. And if you turn to Luke uh, chapter 10, and verse, I'm going to read from verse 25. Uh, it's a well-known uh, uh, Bible reading, and we call it the parable of the Good Samaritan. And so we read, And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him, that is Jesus, to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, What is written in the law? How, how do you read it? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, that is Jesus, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. And he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among robbers? And the lawyer said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. Let's just bow our heads and pray, shall we? Gracious Heavenly Father, as we come to your word, and as we move between various passages and ask ourselves the question, how can I love God? May you, by your spirit, open our hearts uh, so that we truly love you as you intend. May we love the Lord Jesus and all he is. May he be everything we need him to be. And by your spirit, lead us into all truth, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, if we were to read our Bibles in the original language, I haven't, we would find that the brain is never used to describe the thinking, emotional, choosing actions of men and women. In fact, the scriptures speak of many organs to describe those parts of a person's actions, emotions, and will. The kidneys, for example, and if Andy was here, you would like this, are the seat of our deepest emotions. Who would have thought? Try the next chat-up line. I am broken kidneyed. It doesn't ring well, does it? They are the seat of our deepest emotions. Therefore, when we read of our inmost being, the Bible uses kidneys to describe uh, feelings. And so the Beatles singing Love Me Do uh, uh, to describe their feelings of love, perhaps kidneys uh, are the thing we want to consider. I heart you doesn't quite work with the shape of a kidney. 
We all recognize that when we speak of love, we are primarily engaging our emotions. That is our first thought, isn't it? So when we speak of our hearts, we speak of emotions. And popular music, uh, whatever you do, you can go through the 50 top love songs, and they're all going to speak about the heart as the center of our emotions and our emotional life. Now, I don't know about you. My emotions are all over the place all of the time. This is not a good way of thinking about the nature of how we can love God. And indeed, from the scriptures, Psalm 26, verse 2 says, Prove me, O Lord, and try me. Test my heart and mind. Literally, test my kidneys and heart. Psalm 73, 21, David says, When my heart was embittered and I was pierced in my heart. Again, we speak of the kidneys. But when we use heart in the scriptures, we are dealing with the seat of of the mind and not the emotions. The heart deals with our thoughts, our wills, and our intentions. Now, we could continue with various body parts, but we start a new sermon series when we are looking at heart attitudes. And it's pointless speaking about the heart as the center of our emotional being if actually God's wanting to speak to us about the nature of our wills our intentions, our, our desires in terms of our thinking and our functioning. And it's that which we need to consider uh, this evening. And the first one we have is love. We, Pete and I were praying beforehand and he was wondering how we deal with a sermon about love. And you sort of think in Christian terms it should be fairly straightforward. It isn't. Our first foray into heart attitudes, we have to think about not only love as in, forget the emotions, but as in the call of God for us to love him. How do we, how, how do, we do that? How do I love God when my emotions are not the starting point? They can't be the starting point. How can it? The heart deals with our thoughts, our will, and our intentions. And of course, none of us have ever seen God. And if we are honest with ourselves, none of us ever wanted to know God. Isn't that the whole point? We have no desire to love God. We have no desire to know God. We have no desire uh, to obey God. Our desires, before we be became Christian, is, is our own desires. We were quite happy doing our own thing, our own way. We could live our lives quite happily, quite contentedly often, without even thinking about God. In, in fact, our fellow citizens are, are going to be spending all night, every night, all day, every day, not thinking about God. How can they love him? How can they serve him? How can they obey him? What therefore in me has happened such that I now want to serve him, follow him, and trust him for my eternal future? And yes, love him with my will, my intentions, and my inward desires. Why is it that God deserves my love, my loyalty, my affections, my obedience, and my life? Why should all my thoughts and intentions primarily be Godward? You see, throughout the Bible, the love God calls out to us for is never based on emotions. So how do we say, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all our might? Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 and 5 that we had read right uh, at the beginning. It's a command. It's not a, the Lord saying, look, Moses, here's a good idea, a suggestion. One of the options I'll give you is, is to love me. It's not a love me. It's a command to all God's people is to love God. 
Now, I have been a Christian for quite a few years now. I have been uh, married uh, to my dear wife, Annette, for a little longer. I know it's, it's one of those things I have to introduce every so often. Now, I love my wife. My love for my wife started with a physical attraction. In, in the old parliament, par parlance, I fancied her. I think that is probably still technically reasonable. Still do. It was only a little while later... I'm glad she's here tonight and not embarrassed. I'm going to pay for this later. It's only later, as I get to know her and her character and her personality, that my affection grows and progressed to an act of the will, such that I wanted to bind myself to her by asking her to marry me, and she was daft enough to say yes. Now, I loved her and still love her, but my attraction for her began my journey, but that alone would never have been enough to carry me through my journey with my wife. But that can never be the case with God. There was no desire. I did not fancy him. In fact, I did not want to know him at all. I was brought up in a Christian family. I didn't want to know him at all. It was Bernard of Clairvaux who wrote a book in the 12th century as a response to a request from a cardinal. And, it, and he said this, You wish me to explain for what reason and in what measure we should love God. And he says, I should say that God himself is the motive of our love to him. And the measure of love due him is to be without measure. How's that? A love for God to be without measure. We just sung, haven't we, a fantastic hymn that, that, that preaches this brilliantly. Now, Bernard goes on to offer two reasons why we should love God. One, nothing is more reasonable. It is a reasonable thing to love God. And I'll explain why in a minute. And secondly, for us, nothing is more profitable. And in both cases, God himself is the reason why he should be loved, as no one is more deserving of our love than God. And no one is more rewarding of our love than God. So firstly, uh, uh, we should be up to about slide five by now. I realize that this is all kaplooey, but don't worry about that. So firstly, nothing is more reasonable. And within this, God loved us first. And so we go to our reading of 1 John 4, 19. And there we say, we see rather, we love because he first loved us. It never starts from me or you. Never starts because it can't be our emotions and our wills don't want him. And so here is the first reason why we should love God. He has given us the desire to love him. We are quite simply returning to him that which he has already given to us. It is a perfect call and response. It is the natural outflow of the love that he has poured into our lives. I began with speaking of my love for my wife, and I know of and experience her love for me each day. But the issue here is, is that, in essence, we are sinners together. There is, in, in essence, no difference. Look at that. That's an ah moment. Ah. Thank you. We have similar outlooks, experience, but we are both sinners in need of a saviour. But here's the thing. God is not a sinner. He is unutterably holy. He is so pure that we cannot behold him. He is the one who is beyond all our imagining. We are finite in thought and capability. He is infinite in thoughts and capability. He is all-powerful and we are not. We are morally filthy and he is purity itself. Now imagine... Can we put the next click on, please? Imagine you're walking down the street in a rough part of town and you come across this. 
So it's lines of people bedraggled, drugged up, smelling of sweat and urine. Teeth are missing, they're all semi-naked. They stagger around holding on to cheap alcohol or, or passing around needles, smoking crack, whatever else goes on. And what will you do? But of course, perhaps the norm is, is to pass by on the, the other side, to cross the road, to speed up, to turn around and go back the other way. Maybe drop a few coins in a hat, buy a sandwich. But here's the thing. That's a better image of our hearts than the first one. That's a better image of God, what God sees in, in your and my heart than ever the nice, sweet, cute thing. Because we are morally filthy. And outside of Christ, we are, as, we are dirty than that. So why, therefore, should God choose to make himself known to warped, morally filthy, drugged up, semi-naked creatures? And then we come to Romans 5, 6 to 8, and we read, For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. If you like, Christ died for the warped, the morally filthy, the drugged up, the semi-naked. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God loved us first. And for all of us who now profess to trust uh, in Christ, this verse goes to the heart of why we should love God. We love God because he is extravagant in his love uh, towards us. And what does that call out for, from us? It requires no less of a response than that of loving God obedience to him. So why should we love God? Because he loved us first. Bernard, again, writes, these are the claims which God, the holy, the sovereignly great and almighty, has upon the little, weak, and sinful man. Firstly, in love, the father sent his son, John 3, 16. In love, the Son poured out his soul unto death, Isaiah 53, 12. In love, the Spirit teaches what the Son taught, John 14, 26. The whole family of God, the Holy Trinity, loved you and me first. And our reasonable response is to love him back. It is the minimum that is called out for. For if this is true, and it is, then doesn't the almighty God rightfully have a claim upon our love? It is reasonable. And the second thing within the it is reasonable is God deserves to be loved by believers. So since God loved us first, our response must be to love in return. And again, we have Romans uh, 5, 6 to 8, for while we were still weak. We, we, we know that passage. And again, these three verses alone tell us why God deserves our love. And I know it's a, it's a wee bit like a one-stringed instrument, isn't it? Pluck, 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 pluck. The problem is, as Pete said earlier, our hearts grow cold, so I'm going to keep plucking the one-stringed instrument. The world can never love God because when they look at the Lord Jesus hanging on a cross, it is of no consequence. But when you and I look there, it should call out to us. And if it doesn't, you are not a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. For God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 
It is the world that hangs Jesus on a cross, the beloved son of the father. It's the world that nails him to a tree. And on that good Friday, when Jesus, the only begotten, the only beloved son of the father was beaten, spat upon, crushed under the weight of the cross and under the weight of our sin, when the God of all majesty, who at that very moment was sustaining the breath of those who nailed him up there, was stripped naked, nailed to a beam of wood and hoisted up to the contempt of the world and pierced with a spear and reviled. Here's the thing. Gave his dear soul for his friends. For his friends. And it's here at the cross. It's here at the cross. Here why we are called to love God. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. And those of us who claim the name of Jesus have been gifted the ability to love God. When we consider the Old Testament saints, they don't see the cross. They were called to love God with their heart, with their soul, with their, uh, uh, all their might. How could they do this when they knew, in essence, so little? And, but for us, we've seen, we've known so much. We who are this side of the cross, how can we do less than to give God his due? Now there comes, I think we should be sort of clicking on a couple of moments uh, uh, there, I'm afraid. But at a practical level, here's the problem we have. Things get in the way. And the first thing that gets in the way is materialism. This world is too good. We are attached to it by stuff. We are attached to this world by stuff. And because we're attached to the stuff, God becomes a distant second or third or at all. And, and stuff gets in the way. And it may be fantastic stuff. It always, materialism always pushes God out and our hearts grow cold and we don't love him as we should. Certainly not with our mind, strength, might. That, that, that can't happen. We can't have materialism and the love of God in our hearts. It just doesn't work. Secondly, inadequate meditation on all that God has done for us. If we don't think about the things of God, if we don't ponder the things of God, if we don't Read about the things of God. If, if we des here's the thing. If we desire that Christ should come to us and abide in us, we have to fill our hearts with the thoughts of God. Now, we can't fill our hearts with our thoughts of God. We call that vain imaginings. Because the, 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 the people that say, I like to think of God as, you're wrong. You're just wrong. It doesn't need explanation. You're wrong. The Bible teaches us what God is like. And it's he who we love. And it's he who we want to obey. And it's he who we want to follow. But if we don't think about, through his word, all that he's done, well, why are we surprised that the love of God grows cold? So the meditation on God's word matters. Otherwise, we go cold. Thirdly, disobedience. We still want to do our own thing. It, 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 it's the old man clings to us. We still want to do our own thing. God's word, in essence, probably because of the issue under item two there, has little part to play in our habits or our thought life. And so what happens is we disobey. And there's all sorts of things. This, people, we can't say, oh, well, that's legalism. No, it's not. If you love God, the Bible says, you will obey my commands. Jesus said that. He's not some Old Testament sermon. Jesus said, if, if, you, if you love me, you'll obey my commands. Well, he's got a fair number of commands. And they're not legalism. It's, it's, a, it's a loving response to wanting to follow Jesus. It is a reasonable response. It is a right response, uh, uh, surely. There's an Old Testament story of, of when King Saul, Saul was told 
by Samuel to go and destroy the Amalekites, to wipe them out. Uh, they, they were opposed of God and God had opposed them. And of course, Saul functioned with partial obedience. He did a lot of killing, but not all of it. And so there's a load of sheep and goats and all the rest of it. And Samuel comes along and Saul says, look how great I am. I've obeyed the Lord, I've done this. And Samuel simply said, so what is the sound of sheep bleating? Obedience doesn't have to be wholehearted disobedience. It doesn't have to be turning exactly opposite to the Lord. It just has to be partial for it to be total. Disobedience. We want, if we want to love God, we want to obey God with all our minds and strength. And then, of course, what really happens then is the stuff of the world, the materialism, becomes a small thing. It puts it back in its place. And as our desire for God's word grows, won't we always want to do God's will? Brothers and sisters, that is the very best thing for each of us. It may seem at times a hard thing, but it isn't. It isn't. Look to the cross, study the word, share fellowship. It isn't a big thing. And we see in all of this that we are to love God because nothing is more reasonable. It makes sense. Now, secondly, we love God because no one is more rewarding. There is a, a form of Christian teaching often called the prosperity gospel. Uh, and this prosperity teaching has at its heart a belief that God will supply a harvest, a material harvest, which obviously goes away the materialism bit, but will provide a material harvest as long as I pay my dues. And what usually that means is whoever's the pastor of the church where the dues are paid is flying around in a very nice Learjet and, 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 and the punter in the pew is, is, a, is a mug, I'm sorry to say. It is a wicked, wicked, wicked doctrine. So why should God be loved? Not because of stuff. There's the point why the prosperity gospel is wicked, wicked, wicked. It puts the world as heaven. And it isn't. Why should we? God himself is the rewarder of our love for him. God himself is the rewarder. To know God to walk with him. Hebrews 11, verse 23. I know it wasn't one of the readings, but let me read this. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that the child was beautiful and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. Now, let me tell you, Egypt was wealthy. And if you're going to do materialism, you do, the, you do that version of materialism, because that's a lot. And as far as Moses concerned, it wasn't worth that. It was nothing. And he was right. God himself is our reward. We fill up our lives, brothers and sisters, we fill up our lives with stuff and we think we have it all. Uh, just a little more and I'll be happy. The next job, the next relationship, the next house, the next car, and, and the list goes on. It doesn't have to be a big thing. I say this with as much care as I can Insofar as the world is concerned, you can't make a silk purse out of a sow's ear. Because God himself is our reward. So it's reasonable. He is the rewarder. And finally, we ask ourselves, so how should God be loved? 
And we come to our final reading, and it's the well-known reading uh, of uh, the Good Samaritan. Because if you remember uh, uh, in there, uh, we read, it wasn't just that you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your strength. You then go, and you will love your neighbor as yourself. They, and, and Jesus himself says, look, the law and the prophets hang on these two. So if you want to say, what's the Old Testament like? You read those two bits and you go, that's it. You go into an awful lot of detail for these two headlines. Love God and love your neighbor. Complicated, isn't it, Christianity? Love God, love your neighbor. And we demonstrate that we love God by loving our neighbor. And so Jesus tells this wonderful parable, this wonderful story of a man who goes down uh, from uh, Jerusalem to Jericho. Oh, actually, we don't know him, do we? we? But anyway, he's beaten up, robbed, half dead. That's all we know. And a, a priest passes by on the other side and a Levite passes by on the other side and the Samaritan shows mercy. Now, here's the thing. We love God for ourselves' sake and for God's sake. That's not sinful. To love God for ourselves' sake has to happen, doesn't it? For while we were still sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. I was the ungodly, and so it, it's personal. It's a big deal to me that I became a Christian on a certain Sunday evening, on an Easter Sunday evening. It's a big deal to me. It is a precious memory to me. And, and, and you know, I could go around, we won't, but you would have precious memories too. And that's wonderful, absolutely fantastic. So we love God for ourselves' sake, and we love God for God's sake. And so for our self-love, because all he's done for us, because he is our great reward, and we love our neighbor for God's sake. And as we spend time uh, in God's word, and as we obey the Lord, and as we look to all he has done on the cross, a desire should grow in us to demonstrate our love for God. We want to be like him. So as he is the sending God, we go. Some go further than others. And come back. It's fantastic. But he is ascending God and so we go. And it could be that he sends you to your next door neighbor. He is the sacrificial God. And so we give of ourselves. We give our time, but we give in loving sacrifice. And as love for God grows, so our love continues to grow. And consider that story that, that, that Jesus told in Luke. He is beaten, broken. There is nothing about that man that is lovely, wonderful, and calls out to love. It just allows a Samaritan to demonstrate the love that is called out for by the scriptures. It is practical. He doesn't have to say, oh, isn't he a lovely man? I'm just going to, because he's lovely, I'm going to help him out. Nothing of the kind. He is a beaten, bloody mess. And he goes and does what the scriptures require, to love his neighbor as himself. And to love with all our hearts is to undividedly, wholeheartedly, obediently trust in God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It is a heart attitude. I knew we'd get round to the heading of the series. It is a heart attitude. And if we acknowledge that we are followers, that is, disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, how dare we do any less than follow Jesus' example? C.S. Lewis writes this, now the whole offer Christianity makes is this, that we can, if we let God have his way, come to share in the life of Christ. If we do, we shall then be sharing a life which was begotten, not made, which always has existed and always will exist. Christ is the Son of God. If we share in this kind of life, we also shall be sons of God. We shall love the Father as he does. Wow. Wow. We shall love the Father as Jesus does. And the Holy Spirit will arise in us. He came 
to this world and became a man in order to spread to other men the kind of life he has. Every Christian is to be a little Christ. And the whole purpose of becoming a Christian is simply nothing else. It isn't complicated, brothers and sisters. So please, do not leave this place tonight without asking you of yourselves the question, do I love God as he requires? Nothing is more reasonable and nothing is more rewarding. And for those who don't yet love, that is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength, this triune God, don't leave it. Don't leave. Don't leave this place without coming to know the Lord Jesus Christ. The command is there. And he is the great reward. Let's bow our heads and pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, as Pete, as Pete already prayed, our hearts are often cold. And you call out to us that we should love you with all our heart, soul, mind and strength. And we desire that for ourselves. Our oh, gracious Heavenly Father, forgive us uh, when we have been cold and heartless and not desired to obey you. Relight that fire within us so that we are truly seen to be your disciples, your sons and daughters, the ones who demonstrate that at just the right time, Jesus died for me. Amen.